All right, so as I said, chapter 28, a collection of prayers. And um, we spent some, some time last week, or last month, I'm sorry, um, with all the, the reasons that Kadek put this chapter as the last chapter of this book. And one of the most important ways that I found that I agreed with was from um, Haroldo Dutra Gias when he when he was trying to understand better the Jewish tradition when his work with the, the translation of the so-called Bible from its most original copies that I was able to find. And he got together with a um, historian in France who is an expert on the First Testament. And he asked the, that historian student, who is actually a Catholic priest, to guide us on how to better understand the Jewish people, the Jewish traditions, and because they, he could not find much stuff, and he was a device to look at the prayers. And I was a little bit confused, so why the prayers? And this priest explained it to him, because we pray what we believe. We pray what is the most important things for us. And then when he referred to this book, he understood why this book is the very last chapter. This chapter is the very last in this book. It is because here there is a synthesis of what we believe. Here there is a synthesis of everything that is really important throughout this doctrine is as the moral teachings of Christ. Everything is summarized in these chapters, the, ex the explanations of the prayers, the explanation of the Lord's Prayer, More important, we have a tendency to pray words. And here we be instructed of, of how to pray energy. It is, of course, if one prays out loud, you have to use words. And even when we think, unfortunately, we are so conditioned to to use words or you think that you use words when we are thinking but again thought is energy it does not require a word but we think we do and that's fine <clears throat> but when one speak out loud for make the prayer for everyone else the necessity to bathe those words with the energies that you want to project, project to each one, to the environment. Um, we're going to see here the very first prayer is for the, the Spiritist meeting. It is very important for us to understand that. And and the purpose, given a purpose to pray, what are you praying for? You pray for gratitude, you pray for express our adoration toward the divinity, whatever the, you call that divinity, right? And we pray, unfortunately, most of the time for petition, which is fine, we should be asking. So usually a complete prayer, you have the adoration, the petition, and the, and the gratitude. And then as, as a, an example of this, three things concise in one single prayer, uh, the Spirit of Device Kardec to start the meeting or to, to start this chapter with our Lord's Prayer. And I'm going to read the introduction. So, for those who were not here last week, have a good understanding of why the Lord's Prayer is so significant and why it's important to understand to the best of our ability this prayer. I remember one of the passages of Emmanuel, he said that they, 
in there at that level of studies, they still study a lot of prayer. And they still find things here and there that have escaped their, their view, such, such as the condensation, the meaning, the importance of the, this prayer, not only because it was the prayer that Jesus used when he was asked by Peter to teach us how to pray, but because it is that work that's going to tell us how the ability of synthesis of putting one few words, the whole do this, like I praise over here, of us towards God, towards our brothers and sisters, and towards ourselves as well. And then we're going to jump to item five. But I hope that anyone will read from one to five on their own to give sequence from where we will start right now. The writer? Yes. So just read the introduction, um, item two, okay? Okay. You have to pull it up. Okay. <clears throat> the Lord's Prayer Introduction. The spirits have recommended placing the Lord's prayer at the beginning of this collection, not only as a prayer per se, but as a symbol. Of all prayers, this is the way we place the highest, whether because it has come from Jesus himself or because it can place replace all others, depending on the thought one attaches to it. It is the most perfect model of conciseness, a true masterpiece, a true masterwork of sublimity in its simplicity. In fact, in its highly concise form, it sums up all the duties of humans toward God, themselves, and their neighbor. It entails a profession of faith, an act of worship and submission, a request for life's necessities, and the principle of charity. Saying it on behalf of other persons is the same as asking for them what one would ask for oneself. Because of its brevity, however, the profound meaning contained in some of the words that compose it escapes most people. That is why it is usually said without directing one's thought to the application of each of its parts. It is said as a formula whose effectiveness is in proportion to the number of times it is repeated. It is nearly always one of the Kabbalistic numbers three, seven, or nine taken from the ancient superstitious belief in the virtue of numbers and their use in magic. In order to fulfill the vagueness that it, this prayer's conciseness leaves in, my, in the mind, following the counsel of the spirits and with their assistance, a commentary has been added to each clause which develops its meaning and shows its application. According to the circumstances and time available, when one can thus say the Lord's Prayer either in a simple or developed form. Thank you. Welcome. But just to have clear here, the Kadak says in the beginning of this chapter, this, the prayers, were, they were not created by the spirits, they were created by, by Kardec, they were created by the spirits. The spirits dictated, dictated all, all those prayers. And Kadak makes sure that he does add his comment, he does expand on what the spirits have told him through uh, psychography, right? But everything that is published has to be somewhat approved by the spirit of truth, the global of spirits who are truly responsible for this doctrine. And yes, the comments are his, but it's added, it's corrected, and is somewhat allowed to be published by the spirits. And I think that's relevant to make sure that this, we understand that this is a do, is universal doc, doctrine that comes from the spirits. Kardec is the codifier. The tremendous possibility to do the work, but everything that is in here is from the spirits or it's allowed to be published by the spirits, okay? And um, our Lord prayers, just to have a completion of it. The most used form today is 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thou will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us these days our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen, or so be it. We did, and Kazakh break down every single sentence and expand, or the spirits expand the meaning of each one of those sentences, right? We stopped last week on um, item five. We'll start like item five today. We just forgive our debtors, we forgive our debtors, or give, uh, give our, forgive our offenses as we forgive those who offended us. But again, I I urge that everyone read on the very first sentence, Our Father who art in heaven, and catch up with this for those who were not here last week and for us were here last week. The good idea was we pray for this prayer, and the, the Spirit suggests that we can pray the simple form, as I, I just read, or you can expand at the suggestion of the spirits. And again, suggestion. Okay. Um, any questions, any comments before we start? Okay, so right now. Okay. Number five. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive our offenses as we forgive those who offend us. Each one of our fractions of your laws, O oh Lord, is an offense against you, a debt contracted that we will have to pay sooner or later. For these we beg the forgiveness of your infinite mercy, and we promise to make every effort not to contract new debts. You have made charity and express law for everyone. But charity does not consist only in helping our fellow beings in their need. It also consists in forgetting and forgiving their offenses. By what right will we demand your indulgence if we ourselves do not show it toward those against whom we have a complaint? Give us, dear, dear God, the strength to stifle all resentment, all hatred and all grudges in our soul. Ensure that death does not surprise us while we hold a desire for revenge in our heart. If it pleases you to take us this very day from this world, ensure that we may present ourselves to you purified of all animosity, following Christ's example, whose last words were for his executioners. The persecutions that the wicked make, make us bear a part of our earthly trials. We must accept them without complaining, just like all other trials, and not speak ill of those who, out of malice and fact, open to us the way of eternal joy. For you spoke through Jesus' lips, blessed are they who suffer for the sake of righteousness. Thus, may we bless the hand that strikes and humiliate us. For the contusions of the body strengthen our soul, and we will be lifted from humiliation. Blessed be your name, O Lord, for having taught us that our faith is not irrevocably set after death, that we shall find in later existences the means to redeem and repair our past wrongs, and to complete in a new life what we have not been able to do in this one for our advance advancement. Thus, may all the apparent anomalies of life be finally explained. The light is shed upon our past and future as a radiant sign of your supreme justice and boundless goodness. So we, we can see in this Standing of this sentence, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. How in this in this explanation of the sentence, there is pretty much a summary of the 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 beliefs what this doctrine teaches us here, right? It's telling us here that in our remember it is we Speaking with God, right? Is we open ourselves to God completely, right? This is what a prayer is. So we, so we 
telling God it is on. We know that you have created perfect laws. Laws that are meant for our happiness. Laws that are meant for our progress. And we know they are far from being perfect. And, before, and therefore, we understand that we're going to deviate from those laws. And that we will acquire consequences from those deviations. And you understand that your expression of forgiveness towards us is the opportunity to return back to, to the right path. Is to repair the mistakes that we made is to clean up the mess that we have made and move on in that path that you created for us that leads to our, our complete happiness. As we ask that, we understand that part of your divine laws consists in us being indulgent and forgiven to those who perhaps have created some trouble for us, have created some difficulties for us. As we ask you to do good towards us, we assume the responsibility of doing good towards others, towards our brothers and sisters. In that explanation here, there is so much of what the doctrine is all about, right? That is the, the, the understanding of God's laws being perfect and met for our happiness. That is the understanding that chances are we're going go wrong some, sometime, somewhere, since we are far from that perfection, far from being Christ's. And God in his infinite love does not need to forgive us. Forgive us for us. We get upset. God doesn't get upset. We get offended. God does not get offended. That's perfection. But provides to us opportunities of repair. Opportunities to redirect our energy towards rightness, towards goodness, and provide all the necessary tools to make that redirection. Sometimes, may, sometimes may be difficult, may be painful, but we know that leads to goodness, that leads to our happiness. All this is said over here in one sentence, and the the, the spirits open up, kind of. Chew it up. All you have to do now is to digest it. Um, Abone, I have read her hand. Yes. I just wanted to make a comment on um, the part where it says that, uh, it, well, we are being reminded that our debts have to be, we are to take responsibility for our debts and um, we must pay back pay them back sooner or later. And this is um, in direct contrast to what um, major religions teaches, um, you know, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And so um, we actually have somebody else who made a sacrifice to pay back our debts. And here with that explanation um, that enlightens us to um, to take responsibility for the things that we, we do because sooner or later we're going to have to answer for them. I think um, that also encourages us to be careful with how we interact with one another. And, um, you know, contrary to a teaching that tells you that it's okay to make mistakes because somebody else is going to clean up your mess, um, you know, just by simply accepting what it is that he did for you before. Um, 
you know, here we have, we've been encouraged to do better, um, to be careful again with how we interact with each other because we are going to be held responsible for the things that we do. So we are not let off the hook. And, um, you know, it, uh, to me at least, it is one of the, the things that the fundamental teachings of spiritism that, um, that is very, very attractive because um, I want to know that whenever I, I, if I've made a mistake, I have the ability to fix and to write those errors. Oh, excellent. Love that. Thank you so much for that. And um, it gives the example, the, the definition of what is the meaning of Jesus Christ and Spirit is, is the model and guide. A model, a model is something that you should emulate, that you should follow its, its teachings, right? And what he has taught us is to be responsible for the things that we do and to be forgiven as he did right at the cross. But in any way, it would be ex expected that now we can go ahead and mess up our everything for ourselves and for everyone else because Jesus died on the cross for us. What is the reason behind that? The reason behind that? None whatsoever, right? So we indeed, you're right, are responsible for everything that we do. And again, God being all love and justice doesn't really need to forgive us. Forgive us for ourselves, right? When we forgive, we forgive for ourselves. But provides us the tools for us to recognize the mistake, why is the mistake, and to redirect ourselves towards the, the right path. But yes, yeah, I loved your comment. Thank you for that. Yeah. And um, I think that, uh, as you said, it's, it's one thing that attracted you to Spiritism, but it is also something that uh, a lot of people uh, prefer not to deal with, right? Because it's very easy if someone else fix our own mistakes. And the idea of, some, uh, of someone else fixing our own mistakes is very comfortable, very... Uh, lazy lazy way of uh, living our lives so uh, you know it, uh, i i agree with you what spiritism what attracts us to spiritism is uh, you know you're responsible for your acts and you have to face the consequences and uh, and the, the good thing is uh, because people see that in a negative way sometimes oh i have to deal with my consequence of my actions no it's a positive way right the fact that we are the ones that are going to uh, deal with the consequence of our actions and to uh, fix our own mistakes, give us a positive uh, perspective of the future because it depends on us. Uh, I don't depend on anyone else to to progress. I, de I depend, it's, it's all on me. So it's my own responsibility, which is liberating in a sense. All right, any other comment, questions? So as we start um, item six, lead the sentence and then follow with the comment. But you have the, the, the comment, the footnote that uh, John, if not, I can read it. Yeah, it's there. Oh, it's there, okay. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to read, I think, and follow up with the, the footnote, please. Either. Number six? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. No, the footnote. Okay, the footnote. Okay. Some translations read, let us not in let us not into temptation. This rendering would lead one to understand that temptation comes from God, that God intentionally compels people to commit evil. A thought so blasphemous that it makes God equal to Satan. It could not therefore have been what Jesus meant. This is, by the way, in accordance with the common doctrine regarding the role of demons. 
Okay. So this this is important because in the the way that we read here the Lord's Prayer from the spirits is do not let us fall into temptation but deliver us from all evil, right? And the most modern traditional way of saying is let us not into into temptation, right? As if as if God would lead us towards temptation. As if as if God would maybe not me, but maybe my neighbor, or maybe not my neighbor, but me, God would throw temptations on my way, would you know, tempt me for some reason. And the spirits make sure to think that no, that's that's a guest. Everything they understand about God. God is a love and justice. How can someone who loves the, with absolute love will do that to us? I mean, we are parents, we have no kids. Do we throw temptations in front of our kids just to to see how they do react? But no, we don't do those things like that. Because we love them. We want the best for them. We teach them to avoid it. We we teach them the risks that are out there, but we don't throw those risks in their pathway. Can we marry the absolute love? Who do that to us? So the idea this person wants to say with the footnote here is say, we don't think that God would lead us into temptation. So we don't have to ask God to not lead us into temptation. Right? But help us not to fall into temptations. Meaning it's there somewhere. Let us not be at be trapped into it, which is pretty much different than lead us not in tem into temptations. Okay, and we're gonna see here the reasons why it's important. Right up. Okay, six. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. Oh Lord. Give us the strength to resist the suggestions of evil spirits who tempt us away from the path of goodness by inspiring us with evil thoughts. For we ourselves are imperfect spirits, having incarnated on this earth to expiate our wrongs and to make ourselves better beings. The first cause of evil lies within us, and evil spirits merely take advantage of our vile tendencies in which they support us in order to tempt us. Each imperfection is an open door to their influence, whereas they are powerless and give up, give up any attempt against perfect beings. Everything we can do to keep them away is useless if we do not oppose them with a will unshakable in the practice of the good and with the complete renunciation of evil. Thus, it is toward ourselves that we must direct our efforts and then evil spirits will naturally stay away because evil is what attracts them while goodness repels them. Lord, uphold us in our weaknesses through the voice of our guardian angels and the good spirits. Inspire us with the will to correct our imperfections in order to prevent impure spirits from assessing our soul. Evil is not your work, O oh God, O oh Lord, because the source of all goodness cannot engender evil in any way. We are ourselves created by infringing upon your laws and by the ill use we make of the freedom you have granted us. When humans finally begin to observe your laws, evil will disappear from the earth, just as it has already disappeared from the mo more advanced worlds. Evil is not a fatalistic necessity for anyone, and it seems irresistible only to those who complacently abandon themselves to it. If we have the will to commit evil, we also have the will to do the good. Therefore, dear God, we ask for your assistance and that of good spirits to resist temptation. Uh, just recently, we had in our Monday meetings a passage from the, from the book that we read every week that, that deals with this. Jean always used this an example that if you don't have, if you do not have a problem with alcoholism, if you do not have a vice, if you don't have a tendency 
to overdo with um, alcoholic beverage. We could, you can go with all your friends. Everybody wants to go to a bar and have a drink. And you can go with them with no problem. You can go with them and have a club soda or a juice. So you can have a beer or a glass of wine or whatever you enjoy responsibly and without committing any excesses. But if do if you do have a problem with alcoholism, if you have any a a, a, a tavak or a present vice, you could get into two excesses. You could going to a bar could be a risk for you to uh, commit excesses, to go overboard, and everything else. Is it the bar? that causes it? Is it all the drinks or the bottles on the shelf over there that causes it? No, it's all internal, right? It's what you have internally that predisposes you to commit the excesses, that predisposes you to <clears throat> commit some error, and that goes to everything else, right? Um, any kinds of what we would consider to be misbehavior, excesses with sexuality, excesses of um, of greed, excesses of um, or, uh, work, work in excess, right? Um, putting priorities above true priorities, right? Making money is more important than my health. All, all those kinds of things. These are all internal. These are tools that the individual have from its pride, from its um, selfishness that accumulates and that individual needs to, to work it out to get rid of it. So the, the temptation is for one thing, something in town, something that we have, right? The outside stuff may may bring those things up. And again, as I repeat something that Chip Xavier once said, that we are like a lake. Imagine a lake. When when it's quiet, the wind is not blowing hard, there is nothing moving the bottom of it. The water is crystalline, it's nice, clear. We can see the bottom, but the bottom, bottom is stay over there. There's no problem. But when the wind is blowing too hard, or when we stop, we stop messing with the bottom of that lake, then we move the, all the mud that is in the bottom of that lake, all the dead leaves, all, all things decaying over there, messes it up, and now the water is not on, no longer crystalline. It becomes murky, becomes dirty with everything that is in the bottom of that lake. That we should live our lives trying to keep that water crystalline. Don't mess with the bottom of that lake. Left the dirty, the, the being slowly being decaying and disappearing, being consumed. That is resisting the temptations. To not resist temptations would be like messing up with the bottom of ourselves that we have those things. We have those ill tendencies. Those things that you should leave quiet over there because it's a law of nature. If you don't use it, you lose it. Eventually, those things will be broken down and going to disappear. And the way that we do that is, one, as the Spirit tells us here, the greatest the recipe to success is working to goodness. Keep your mind busy into doing good. Keep your hands busy doing something good. Keep your thoughts elevated to goodness. Then you don't have room, you don't have time, you don't have space to be messing up with the bottom of that lake. 
and the water stays crystalline on that. But idleness opens room of opportunity for us to uh, stop messing with that bottom of that lake, to retrieve all those EU tendencies that's there. And then it becomes a problem. And then when you, if you have a tendency for excess of alcohol, you get inside of that bar, you may be tempted. But not because the bottoms of the shelf was calling you. Much of the contrary, because you were calling those bottoms now. So this place, this center of this place, extremely important to not let us fall with temptation. Let us keep ourselves in the in the good side of things, doing the best that we can. And very important. The, the less evolved the spirits, I'm not gonna call them evil here, because of what is insist on the path of progress just like ourselves. We may be called evil in the eyes of someone else out there, but ignorant spirits in the path of progress maybe may try to invite us to mess with the bottom of our lake. But they cannot put within us what we do not have. They cannot create something that we do not have inside ourselves. So it's important to the center of the says, Oh Lord, give us the strength to resist the suggestion of evil spirits, suggestions, okay? who tempt us away from the path of goodness by inspire us with evil thoughts. Sentiments generate thoughts. The spirits can, can inspire us of thoughts but can only happen after you already have the sentiments there, okay? The purified sentiment, walking to goodness, trying to do goodness, will not generate um, evil thoughts, regardless who is suggesting that to us. But we ourselves are imperfect spirits, have incarnated on this earth to expiate our wrongs and to make ourselves better beings, the forgiveness of God towards us providing us the necessary tools to understand where we went wrong, why we went wrong, and give us the tools and the means to redirect our energies towards the correction and thus follow the right path. The first cause of evil lies within us, and evil spirits merit, merely take advantage of our vile tendencies in which they support us in order to tempt us. Again, the first cause of evil lies within us. And the good spirits can only use what we have. They cannot put anything in there, but they can use the, what's already there. It's extremely important. So this, this sentence, perhaps not the more important, not more important than the one else, but extremely important. Let us try to keep our evil tendencies in the in the bottom of that lake and not let's bring us bring it to the tone of our lives. And if for whatever reason it happens because it will happen, circumstances of life will lead us perhaps to to bring the worst of us. As an example, the the war that we're facing to witness those days, the injustice they are saying today, it may give us a thought of, oh, they cannot do that. It's We have to exterminate this. We have to stop that with anger, with a statement of anger. You now, as the great, the greatest thing of the, um, of the movement for equality in this country, is when they would say, we will fight for justice, not because we hate injustice, but because we love justice. It's completely different. The movement 
of of liberation of Gandhi without violence. It's completely different of 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 a rebellion. It's inspirational. It's it's one step above. We're gonna love. We're gonna fight for freedom because it's the right thing, but we're not going to commit violence towards it. Completely different. So it's not that we should not seek to do the right thing. Because that's contrary. Let's do the right things, but for the right reasons and use the right tools. Because if not, we become, we allow those bad things in our lives. In our life, it's very likely, if it's not in this incarnation, very likely in this incarnation, but in previous incarnations, that we soften injustices, that we have been offended, that we have been hurt, and that we have in us things that will tempt us toward anger, toward retaliation, toward uh, making jobs with our own hands, because of all those experience that you have. And if you work toward justice, based on those bad experiences, we are committed an error. But if you redirect that energy, say, I understand the injustices, I was victim of it, I understand the offenses, I was victim of it, and I walk, I seek to walk toward justice, that no one suffered what I have suffered, for love towards my neighbor, not for hate of those who are committing it now. It's completely different. And in this prayer, let us not in temptation, helps us to follow that direction. Let us not use my anger to seek retaliation. But let me transform my anger into an energy that brings justice the people, the just, same just they don't like to have happened to me. We are being witnessed that today. The news are that showing that to us today. How are we reacting to it? So let us let us not intention. Let us not act on those bad things that I still have within myself. I will walk to get rid of it. It's the mud on the bed on the bottom of the lake. That if I do not act on it, it will disappear because of the law of nature. You don't, use it, you don't use it, you lose it. All right, comments, questions? Um, Ebony raised her hand. Oh, yes. Earlier, I wanted to say that um, that particular line in the prayer, um, now having that explanation as to its meaning, when you say that line, um, at least for me, uh, there is a deep sense of hope and encouragement um, because we have the explanation that tells us that yes, we are still imperfect spirits and it is those imperfections that attract um, others, other spirits, other individuals to tempt us. But yet we know that evil, it says at the bottom, evil is not a fatalistic necessity for anyone. So we're not designed to commit evil, right? We can't just throw up our hands in the air and say, oh, well, I was born that way. I don't, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, if somebody tempts me, um, you know, I'm just going to come to tempts me to commit evil. Then I don't have any other choice but to do that. Um, that isn't true. Um, there is a deep sense of hope because we know that we have that uh, support from our guardian angels and the good spirits. All of us, in spite of our evil tendencies and our, and our evil natures, we have good spirits around us, chief of whom is our guardian angel, whom we can call upon at any moment, whatever it is that we are going through. Um, so knowing that, when we say that line, um, we can say that with a deep sense of confidence, you know, help me 
to overcome that temptation um, because I know that it is my willpower that I'm using to yield to that temptation. And it is that very same willpower that I'm going to have to use to yield to your good um, urgings, to your good uh, inspirations. All I'm asking is for you to help me to hear your voice. Um, so I just think that just having that explanation to what it is that that line in the prayer actually means when we say it now, um, we can say it with, with, with a deep sense of hope and conviction and, you know, just knowing that we are going to help have the help that we need. Thanks. Um, again, very, very important. I have circled this sense over here. Evil is not a fatalistic necessity for everyone. That's extremely important. Thank you for that. The idea that uh, someone would incarnate to commit some wrong is absolutely against the absolute love and justice of God, right? If there is so-called evil, in this world today is what we bring is what we do. No one in no circumstances will incarnate with an object with a purpose to do something wrong, to go to do anything that is contrary to the to the divine laws. We do it, all of us do it, out of our ignorance out of our inability to keep that mud in the bottom of our lake. Always bring back the words within us and act, and act on it, which is extremely important because again, because of us being so far from perfection, there will be circumstances in life that will kind of mess with the bottom of that lake. Things that will make us reflect on those things that we would rather live along the bottom, the bottom of that lake, but you no know, life happens. You know? Anyone who drives in New York City knows that very well. Um, but to not act on it. If you do not act on those thoughts, if you do not act on those moments of anger, of right or selfishness whatever the, the case may be it will go away and the water will be calm again and very important what you said is that we are not alone in this god understand our weakness god understand our necessities and provide assistance to us the idea that we have a protecting spirit with us that is, assume the responsibility, a much superior spirit than we are, we are, to help us, especially those moments. Count on those spiritual guys protecting, protecting God, fighting spirits. When you feel that you are right to give in to the worst of you, pray, 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 and pray will help you. Quiet things down. You know, let let the wind, the wind, the wind, the storms quiet down inside of yourself so the mud settles down again and the water be crystalline once again. Count with which your spiritual guide, and that is in the Miriam's book on passing when we are asked, says, Use us, count on us, we are here for this. We love if you call us more often. I wish you guys would call us more often than what than what we do. Let's do that because by that will help us not to fall into temptations. And God provide us those individuals to be there with us because we need them, and they're there to be used. Again, philosophically speaking, a flute is kept when it's being played because that's the function of the flute. Those spiritual guides, they're not to guide us, they're guides. They want to guide us. Let's use them, let's they guide us. And we can always be in touch with them with a prayer. Okay? Anyone else?
to the last one that we. You know, uh, Elmo. Before you go on, uh, uh, you know, we're so so um, so great to have this expanded uh, explanation of the Lord's Prayer. How many years I've said the Lord's Prayer, and uh, although I have the um, uh, uh, a simple or um, uh, sh shallow word uh, understanding of it, this in depth. Um, the description of each clause is so beneficial, and uh, I think I'm gonna like uh, copy it out and uh, and pass this around because it, uh, it it expands upon our understanding so much. No, it's and again, it's as Kardec explains over here, it's the synthesis of the whole the whole teaching of Christ basically <laughs> in those few sentences. And it could be um, expanded even more, right? Because as the matter said, he, they started the spray in, the, in in that level where they, whatever they hang out in the in the highest spheres of existence, and they're still discovering more into this prayer, and more and more and more. So much is the ability of synthesis of, of more perfected spirit, and image of a perfect spirit. And when someone asks Jesus, you know, teach us how to pray, it's obvious you'd provide us with some with extreme sublime thoughts and, and eloquence that give us all that we need, all, the, all our duties towards God, towards ourselves, and towards the humanity as a whole. And all that concise in a few words of it. And again, so so be it. You no, know, whoever give any thought to so be it. Amen. <laughs> so you say I'm done. You no, know? I'm done. Let's see what they say about this. Okay. Number seven. So be it. Oh Lord, may it please you that our desires be fulfilled. Nonetheless, we bow down before your infinite wisdom regarding all the things that we have not been given to understand. May it be done according to your holy will and not ours. For you desire nothing but our good, and you know better than we do what is useful for us. We address this prayer to you, O Lord, for ourselves. We also address it to you for all suffering souls, whether incarnate or discarnate, for our friends and our enemies, for all those who ask for our help, and in particular, for the per person's name here. Yeah? We pray for your mercy and your blessing upon all. Here, thanks may be rendered to God and requests made for ourselves or for others. Mm. Nothing to add over here. Again, yeah. we, we think that so be it means no, I'm done. I did what I must responsibility to say, repeat these words. But if you reflect on it, so be it. So be it. So may it be done according to your holy will and not ours, for your desire, nothing but our our good, and and you know better than we do what is useful for us. So that's that is the meaning to me that I when I read this, of so be it. And I hope that from now on, when you say so be it, or amen, or it's the same thing, we mean exactly that. Let it be done in accordance to it, your, your, your will. And let us have the active resignation to resign to, to your, your will, because we know that it all leads to goodness. It may even be a little bit painful, it may even be temporarily difficult for us, but if it is your will, it is because what's best for us, and you resign to it. Um, Aboni? Thank you. Um, so be it reminds me to submit myself wholeheartedly to the will of God. 
after I say this prayer and any prayer. Um, just knowing that regardless of what it is that I pray for at the end of the day, um, it is God's sovereign will and his power that is going to, um, is going to determine everything. And again, it, 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 it's a reminder that we have to humbly submit ourselves to his greater designs. And um, once we have that kind of, um, that, that, that kind of idea within ourselves, whenever we pray, um, we can also pray to understand what God's will is so that we pray according to his will, knowing that once we finish pray, um, we can say with confidence, amen, so be it, knowing that his will is going to be done. Right, thank you. And again, for now on, when you say so be it, that's what we are expressing. That's the energy that we bathe. These three simple words, so be it. You're not going to need to go and say, so let it be done in accordance to your will because you know more than we do than we do, and everything that you want for us is the best for us. So be it means all that. We're gonna say this this three words, but this three words will reflect all of that. It's just not I'm done, thank you, bye. It's a lot more than that. You know, it's interesting, uh, again, here's uh, how simple, uh, you know, amen, uh, my understanding is that so be it is uh, the equivalent of amen. Yes. But the uh, but the fact that, uh, you know, for all years of my life saying amen, it was a, a, a respectful way for, I thought it was like a respectful way for ending it. Uh, and... Uh, and so be it says even even in, in a uh, without looking in depth to the the understanding of so be it, you get the idea of um, uh, it's not in your hands. It's uh, you know uh, it's in God's hands. So be it. You know, um, resigning yourself that it's uh, His will. And uh, I don't know. You know, I've sang Amen a million times. I, I've uh, uh, how much is needed to just that word to, to change that word to so be it. I didn't realize it's so great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but but yeah, but it is also that you don't let let it slide by. It is a a, res, a way of respectfully ending that powwow with the divinity, that little conversation of divinity as well. Now, when we when you get to the spiritist meeting now, it's still in the part of the of, of the general uh, prayers, right? Because that here start taking breaking down things more, right? We completed the Lord's prayer. And very directed to us, the spirit is this very first prior part, right? It's very direct to the spiritist movement, right? It's the spiritist prayers over here, the dealing with the, the meeting itself, with the mediums. Of course, we do not. Um, expect that to be a part of general prayers outside of spiritus, right? Because it's essentially it's spiritist meetings. But we know that is for the general universal good as well. It, it can be extended outside of a uh, spiritist set as well. For the mediums, so the mediums who are working, who are doing service inside the Holy Spiritist um, Center, but you know that 
mediumship does not belong to spiritus. We know that there are mediums everywhere who don't even know that they are mediums, right? And this plague also owned the mediums as well, not necessarily the ones who work inside of, um, of, of a spiritist set. And there's many good ways of, of working in mediumship, not necessarily inside of um, the spiritist centers. And in item four, where the two or three are gathered in my name, there I will, there I will be in, in the midst, and there will be with, be with us. It's not also, also limited to a spiritist meeting, right? It's where two or three gather in his name. Could be in any, anywhere. And also this me particularly believe here now, when I believe that when Jesus said in his name, not necessarily in his name, not necessarily calling the name Jesus Christ, but in the name of the things that he represents, the meaning of the things that he came here to teach us, in the name of this thing that we call charity, love towards God, benevolence, indulgence, generosity towards the difficulties of others, forgiveness. Anyone who comes with those sentiments, with those goals and objectives, is in the name, is God in the name of, of Jesus. <coughs> not necessarily calling the name of Jesus, not perhaps even heard of Jesus in their entire lives but bringing what Jesus represents, what he comes to teach us. So I think that goes outside. The spiritist movement go out, even out of Christianity, but anyone who comes with the sentiments of the teachings of Jesus in mind, God, two or three gathers, that Jesus will be. Because again, it's my belief Jesus did not come here to create Christianity. God come, came here to purify us, to lift us up towards the perfection that also awaits us. Doesn't he then want to be called his name? Okay. Laura raised her hand. Okay. Laura. Ahead, Laura. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a question. I hope I'm not getting reverb on your end, so hearing reverb on mine. Um, you stated that the mediums are mediums even outside of medium meetings. It states this also in another area of the gospel. But Mediums only use their mediumship during the medium's meeting. And it happens out in normal life. You'll come across people and, you know, you'll know. You'll get a message about them. You'll get an, um, a su good suggestion about them. But you're not supposed to say anything. You're not supposed to interrupt. I know the other side of that, the flip side of, you know, you can just talk with people and you will pick up a spirit, um, you know, because some of us can feel that. And so that way, you know that you definitely have taken something from this person that will then go and get help. But in the other instance of when you do pick up on situations about other people and a possible good suggestion, you know, as far as I know, we keep these things to ourselves as to not to interfere with others. But in the statement of mediums are always mediums, even outside of the official spiritist mediums meeting, does that ever come into play? Because in other aspects of mediumship outside of spiritism, um, people who are a medium sometimes will go and tell a person if something is um very specific and, and very strong um 
you know, but that's in a different, I guess, in a different type of mediumship where that's what people do normally and they're not doing what, you know, what we do in mediums meetings. I hope I'm explaining this well, if I'm making sense. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if there's a question. You need to understand everything you said, but if there's a question, the question would be, what to do with our with our mediumship outside of spirit spirit well, center when we notice something on someone, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. So you go back to two pretty smart guys from the ancient Greek. First one I forgot his name, but is the is the father of the of medicine to do no harm, right? One thing to do no harm. And another one for Socrates, right? Speak only if it's the truth, if it's good, and if it's useful. Both three things together, right? So we put that together to do no harm. And then we speak only if it's the truth, if it's useful, if it's good. That's how I meet him should act. Outside and inside of the, the spiritual center. If you note something about someone in the subway that you don't know what it believes, the understanding of the, those individuals. And we start to say, oh, there is a spirit next to you who is saying this and this and that, or with my mediumship ability, I have noticed this upon you. How is this individual receive that? Right? We we don't know. We may you may even put yourself at risk, depend depending on on how that individual received the information you provided. But as I said, you can bring this to the spirit itself and say, oh, I haven't noticed this and that. I want to pray for this individual. I want to, say, I want to see if we can bring that uh, spirit who is causing some kind of harm to someone that I saw in the, in the subway and was somewhat um, attracted by this case. I want to see if I can do something about it. Maybe that spirit will come in a leadership need and be able to help that individual. Maybe we can start a conversation with this individual and see how much information this individual is able to receive. Um, perhaps even inviting, come. We have a center, can come and talk to us. But again, to be useful, to, to do some kind of goodness. And always resource to prayer, as we are doing here. You can always pray to, to, the, to that individual, always pray to that spirit. Um, when I see those crazy people coming the subway now, we're screaming and talking. No, I just pray. If this is if this spirit is being if it isn't really be obsessed by a spirit, or that spirit. Leave him alone, come to our spiritual center, ask Jen why we can have a conversation over there in prayer. And I don't have any mediumship, ostensive mediumship, because we are our mediums. How many mediums you, you think have discovered spiritism? You yourself is an example. How many years do you? spend of your life being a stance that you need to have not the understand that you have now. And throughout how many throughout this world I did the same situation that you were not too long ago. So mediumship everyone will have. Once you educate, you understand the mediumship, you can use it in a more productive way. But without knowing what spiritism teaches you will have the values of Jesus Christ. So you use that mediumship in the proper way. If you use the advices of 
Socrates to know speak only if it's useful, good, and the truth, you really use that mediumship in the right way. So there is many ways that a medium will express that mediumship. Going to visit sick people in the hospital, make a prayer to them, which will, with your mediumship, you can be extremely valuable to them. There is many, many ways that people are using that mediumship today without knowing spirituals. And of course, when you educate at yourself, then you are able to educate your mediumship and make it a much more valuable tool at your hands to help others and especially helping yourself. Does it answer your question somewhat? Yeah, yeah, I, I believe so. You know, I just kind of know it's the rule of thumb that we never say anything outside of, you know, the spirit dispenser. Um, even within the spirit dispenser, you know, we're very careful as to what we say. We just don't go up to a person and say anything. Um, we always get your advice or give the, the information to you and Joao. And then, you know, it goes from there, whether or not if it's useful for the person or not, because it's always such a fine line. Um, I know that so much organically happens outside of the spiritual center. Um, it happens all the time, like every week, uh, you know, especially going out of the, in and out of the places that I've been recently, a lot of nursing homes, a lot of um, hospitals a lot of uh, assisted living facilities and just in meeting a lot of people who work in the medical field, uh, you know, being able to feel when it happens and be aware of when it happens. Um, you know, I so used to, I just disregard it now because I know it's part of the process and I know it's part of the help in which that person is now, um, I guess they've gained the merit in order to receive that help to, and that spirit also needs to leave that person. So, you know, in that respect, that's just part of the process in what we do. Um, like you say that, you know, we're an ambulance and so therefore we're going to attract spirits, going to the spirit to center and they're going to come along. Um, yeah, but I guess um. You know, saying something to someone is, you know, a different situation. Um, unless they know, you know, they're close to you and they know that you're a medium, then it's a little bit of a different circumstance. But, but I think, um, I think you can always uh, help people without uh, telling them that you are a medium, that you are hearing from a spirit. You can uh, talk to a person like, uh, you know, like, uh, give words of comfort, of hope, of uh, even if you use what you heard from uh, through your mediumship, but not openly say that it's uh, it comes from the spirit. Something that can may scare people or may think people may may uh, make people think that you are you know crazy or something. So I think there are ways of uh, of dealing with it. Uh, Yes, uh, we never recommend you to go and talk to people about what you are hearing from the spirits or what the spirits are saying, unless the person is is open to it and uh, is uh, willing to to and understands it. But uh, but I think there are other other ways to to yeah. communicate. And so many times it just happens so organically, like you'll meet a person and they have a situation that winds up being and they start a conversation with you and you you're just minding your own business and it just happens to be an acquaintance somewhere out in the world and they start this conversation with you and the next time thing you know is that you have some experience in that and the conversation comes about and you know something that can help them and I, you know, that happens a lot. And that's not necessarily um, mediumship, that that's more like a synchronicity, you know, where you're supposed to meet this person and give them that help. Um, 
that helps them. And it just happens completely naturally. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Can even imagine who is the medium there, huh? The one who approached you asking for help is perhaps who with the ostensible leadership not knowing of it, but was able to perceive with that, with his or her leadership, that you were someone that, that could help. Who knows the possibility? The fact is, there are things that we have no control of that we have regardless of our leadership or not, right? As a, an example of Chico Xavier, when he was a student, Pedro Leopold, one who is still being severely combated for his leadership and his work of talking to the dead and all that stuff. Then in one of the meetings, in open meetings to the public, he noticed with his leadership, a woman who was about to have a myocardial infarction. And he saw that that woman was pretty close to dying from that infarct. There was nothing he could do about it. But in his prayer, he asked, please don't let it happen inside this center here right now. This, we are suffering so much retaliation for doing the work that we do over here. If this woman dies inside here, they're going to see this as the work of the devil because people die inside my thing. And, and his, um, his petition was taken into consideration and they were able to treat that woman partially. She was able to go home, okay, and he discarded at night in her own bed with no problems. There is an example of the ostensive mediums who you perceive things that is an observation, basically, that they cannot change the destiny, they cannot change the future of individuals. That they, it's, it's there because they see, because they see the same way that we see our physical wise, physical things. The same way that we hear with our physical ears, things that you know the sound waves bring into our ears and we transform into words, whatever came into our ears, can't help it, right? Very often, medium will have this power. You see, we hear, we perceive things because they are there, because they have that extrasensorial perception. What do you do with this is what really matters. And then it's what we have to apply to do no harm, number one. Number two, just speak, just act. If it's the truth, if it's good, and if it's useful. And you said that the useful is a big part of it. We have to make sure that our good intentions bring something good. And that means to educate ourselves morally first, and then we educate our mediumship to use it in accordance with our moral values. Thank you, Alma. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, it's fine. You're mute. You mute yourself. That must be so difficult for you, Laura, always having to. Uh... Um, categorize the messages that are coming to you uh, when you you know you're up and about uh, and com confronting other people uh, because uh, you know you get the idea that um, uh, some spirit is uh, is initiating this for you to pass along a message and now you kind of have to put it through the filters and uh, and the the message might be just the message that um, uh, your, your father is thinking about you or something like that. And uh, it seems benign. And uh, so uh, to not say things, it must be so difficult. Well, it's always, it's thoughts and feelings. Um, 
and you can feel the energy, you know, come nearby. And I try to decipher whether it's a light energy, like we receive in the um, good spirit messages at the end of the meeting, or if it has a denser energy to it, because that helps to differentiate the type of spirit in which it is. Um, for most part, I ignore a lot of everything. The ones that happen organically, I kind of recognize midstream that this is a meeting that's supposed to happen. So I'll give more information about myself that may help another person from an experience that I went through. Um, but, you know, some I always kind of have hesitation and I always try to, um, in those experiences to say the right thing and just to give the helpful information that I know from my own experience as opposed to, um, I guess, a suggestion that may be coming through, uh, if that makes enough sense, because it is, you know, it's that fine line. And like Elmo said, to do no harm. So I never want to say anything that would be harmful. But um, just an example, something happened the other day in ShopRite. I was looking to get yogurt and a man literally turned around and he said, can I ask you a stupid question? Mm -hmm. And I shook my head, yes. And I said, you know, no questions are stupid. And he said, I'm thinking about becoming a vegan because I have kidney problems. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, if it would be good. And, you know, I haven't um, gone through to get, you know, the blood work done and the help because from the doctor because I don't have insurance. And interestingly enough, I had had stage three kidney disease. And it was around when I first started coming to the Spiritual Center. Um, and I told him, I said, they know everything through your blood and through your urine. And he knew what EGFR was. He knew what creatinine was. You know, um, he knew what potassium levels were. He, uh, and, you know, I, I told him my particular problem. And the doctor who I went to, who helped me greatly after I went to three other doctors, I finally found this one woman and I followed her plan. She said I was an anomaly. I didn't fit into any specific um, disease category. And I got off having to take the extra potassium. My EGFR went from like a 28 back to a 70. Um, meaning that my kidneys were then functioning properly as opposed to improperly. And I actually just got uh, released from her care um, a few months ago. She said, I don't have to come back anymore because uh, I've been doing so well. And I told him, you know, you have to have the blood work. I said, yes, it's going to cost money. I said, but I wound up in the hospital. I almost died from having such critically low potassium. And I said that kidneys go one way or the other you can have multiple different types of problems and you know maybe being vegan is not what's best for you because I used to be vegan I went off of being vegan because it wasn't good for me um I eat lean proteins but for my body for my health in order to regulate my problem I had to eat meat and you know that that's not for everybody but I get it I was vegetarian I was vegan and you know I said you just don't know unless you get your blood work and you have to know and then and he took my doctor's name and it was something really weird because we were standing there at the dairy cabinet and I was waiting for him to pick his thing out and I wanted to get yogurt. And he literally turned around and just started talking to me. So I believe in that instance, I gave that information. He took my doctor's number. You know, my doctor 
I believe they do take cash. A lot of doctors around here will take cash now, at a, and it's at a discount. There's also the um, health department will give you low care, um, low cost blood work. So I think that meeting was important. And I didn't say, you know, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. I said, this is what happened to me. And I think you need to really get help from the doctor and educate yourself to find out what's best for you and moving forward. But that happened organically. And then, and towards the middle and end of that conversation, I realized what was happening. You know, that it was most likely, um, it was supposed to happen. But that was not a spirit near me saying, you need to talk to this guy and tell him these things. It happened through natural conversation. He was the one that kept bringing, you know, he, he was the one that basically just spilled out everything. You know, I have this and I have this and I have this. And it was just something I was like, well, you know, I had stage three kidney disease. And it, you know, it took a while for me to heal from that, but it's possible. I said, I listened to the doctor. I did everything that she said, and it worked. And now I don't even take any medication, and all my numbers are really good. So I think that meeting was supposed to happen in that way, and that was organic. So that's why I gave my personal information, you know? Uh, I hope I explained it well. Very good. Maybe a spirit moved him to reach out to you. Exactly, right. Okay. All right, time is up. Yeah. Um, so next Sunday, uh, we will have the study of the Medium's book. Um, we are doing uh, the first part of it. Um, the following Monday, the, the, the 19th is President's Day. It's a holiday, so as you know, I will be closed, but uh, we will announce throughout the week. Okay. Carol, can I do a final prayer? Sure. Thank you very much, Elmo. And thank you, John, and especially Shreda for reading today. Infinite creator and all goodness and grace, we give heartfelt thanks to be together as brothers and sisters for our study of the gospel according to Spiritism, chapter 28, regarding general prayers. May our prayers be sincere not frivolous or showy. May we pray humbly without ego in accordance to the natural laws. May we ask for patience, courage, resignation, and forgiveness as we do our part to receive what is needed. May our sentiments be purified and uplifted with faith. May we stay focused and aligned with goodness and positive inspiration. Our vibration and energetic field matters. <clears throat> Excuse me. Continue to pray to evoke the benefactors and good spirits for this inspiration, hope, clarity, and guidance. Ask, believe, receive with gratitude and thanks from the heart. So be it. As we give thanks to the spiritual benefactors and good spirits for guiding us and inspiring us today, may we receive the love, light, and peace of Christ within us and for our loved ones, our teachers, our directors, the counselors, the mediums, the workers, and all who are participating today. We pray for inner peace and especially now for world peace and for those who are suffering in the physical and spiritual worlds. We pray for SGNY and all spiritual centers throughout the world that they may grow, expand, and be protected each hour of the day and night. As we close now, we humbly ask for safety and protection 
as we return to family, friends, loved ones, and co-workers. May we go forth now as beacons of love, of light, of peace, of service, and of charity, which is love in action. So be it. <laughs>